Next, our first speaker is Petra Long Berndt. She is currently a lecturer in the Department of History of Art at University College London. She has a PhD from the University of Hamburg, and the title of her dissertation, leading towards today, Preserves Animal Bodies in Modern and Contemporary Art, 1850 to 2000. <clears throat> she has held uh, academic positions uh, in Hamburg at the Center for the History of German-Speaking Film in the Art History Department uh, at the uh, Technische Universität in Dresden, in the Art History Department at Trier University, um, and at the Collaborative Research Center uh, at the University of Siegen. She's, uh, in addition, done curatorial work as a guest curator at the Kunsthalle in Hamburg, at the Akademie der Kunst in Berlin, at the Hamburger Kunstverein, uh, and uh, did an exhibition at the Albertinum and the Grunusgewölbe uh, in uh, Dresden in, I guess, just this past year, 2014-15. It's an exhibition on Mark Dian, Mark Dian, the Academy of Things, which uh, she curated in Dresden. And before that, in Hamburg, it curated an exhibition at the Kunstverein, A World of Wild Doubt, and before that, an exhibition on Zygmar Polka, We Petty Bourgeois, Comrades and Contemporaries, the 1970s, an exhibition in three parts, one devoted to clique, one to pop, one to politics, which won the Exhibition of the Year Award from the International Association of Art Critics German section. Uh, publications, uh, her dissertation on animal art, uh, a monograph, catalogue raisonné of the work of Memphis Schulze, a reader for MIT Press, forthcoming in 2015, Materiality, Documents of Contemporary Art. And beyond that, the next project, forthcoming in 2016, Forming Collectives, Colonies, Communes, and Squats in Contemporary Art. So from the squat to the animal, uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, Petra to the podium. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction and for inviting me. Um, sorry, do I need to point it somewhere? Oh, great. Okay, that explains everything. Okay, since 2000, parallel to the rise of social media, there has been a renewed interest in taxidermy. The mounting of animals in lifelike poses has been popularized to a degree that it has almost become the new knitting. <laughs> At the same time, taxidermy is commonplace in contemporary art. Here you can see on the upper left Mark Dyan's Star Museum, a creation from Scott Bibbis, member of the Minnesota Association of Rogue Taxidermists, as well as a sculpture by duo Afke Goldstein and Floris Buckler. With a recent sensibility in the humanities for things as accumulations of technical and symbolic knowledge, as well as their role as rebellious actors, the urgent question arises how to care for such organic substances. Modern and contemporary art are generally char characterized by a, a dynamic experimentation with unusual materials and processes. One encounters everyday stuff such as trash or bodily waste, or artists even collaborate with engineers to manufacture new matter atom by atom on a nanoscale. These materials, as we've been debating the whole day, are not enduring anymore, but ephemeral and temporal with a short lifespan. To care for these artworks, to guarantee their historically pertinent reception, presents a new kind of challenge. How should one deal with the short-term durability of organic materials such as animal bodies? Do extreme materials call for extreme conservation? So let me introduce uh, a recent art installation that addresses these questions. In 2007, a red fox, common sight on the streets of London at night, made an unlikely appearance in the central hall of the Natural History Mu Museum. And we enter into the main hall and go to the left into one of these niches where one could encounter this animal. As still life, this fox was the focal point of artist Tessa Farmer's installation, Little Savages. Unlike the other mounted animals one encounters in this cathedral of science, which demonstrate the educational function of taxidermy, this fox stands out. 
It merges with its surroundings, its boundaries are forced open by a multitude of animals and insects that are nesting in its skin, forming cocoons, mangy tangles, or excesses. This animal, famous for its cunning intelligence, is upsetting the order of nature as introduced by the public part of the museum. Farmer's unruly creature with its infested fur and disintegrating body looks clearly like every conservator's nightmare. And this animal is full of surprises. After zooming in to the details of a beetle or a bee, one suddenly becomes aware of an even smaller body torturing the former and in turn of an unknown world. One spots something that normally has no place within taxonomies of natural history. The agents of this change are a swarm of tiny insectoid fairies, carefully handcrafted out of plant roots and bee wings. These mischievous creatures that are linked to buzzing and scurrying insects and their behavior are incredibly small, almost invisible, easily slip under the radar of human perception and lead their lives in secret. And they are by no means fair. These hybrid life forms, in order to survive, constantly enslave or fight animals such as bees, wasps, or ants that appear within a compound, a network, colony, or swarm. Farmer's skeletal and strangely sexless creatures let clear distinctions between the worlds of the living and the dead, cultivated and wild, collapse when they resonate with hell, where Belzebub is the lord of the flies and forms lose their integrity. They have ancestors in the fallen angels that resulted from the war in hell, uh, sorry, war in heaven, <laughs> or those who torture poor souls in depictions of the last judgment, uh, as here. Um, you can see another work by Farmer on the left, The Fairy Horde and the Hedgehog Host from 2010, and on the right, a detail from The Last Judgment by Hans Memling. So in which way does this installation comment on the Natural History Museum, an institution that wants to preserve nature? How exactly could one describe the materiality of taxidermy, and what kind of stories are woven into its texture? and, of course, which questions arise for conservation practices. <coughs> when the Natural History Museum opened in 1881, mounted animals were the main attraction, promising an encounter with paradisiacal, unspoiled nature. The skillful arrangement of tanned skins and seemingly animate poses, however, has long attracted controversy. Quite different to the Museum of Natural History in New York, um, today most of these displays made of fragile organic materials, a legacy of the Victorian area, have been replaced. Visitors are guided through multimedia information-rich environments, like the Earth Hall on the left or the world of dinosaurs, that are barely distinct from our everyday experiences of digital technology. The history of nature is condensed into a spatialized app, while mounted animals are, in fact, a rarity. But the taxidermized animals were not deaccessioned. Rather, these crafted objects can be described as an infection of the past. At a certain moment in the museum's history, they needed to be locked away in order to establish new narratives about ecology and sustainability, but they nonetheless persist out of sight. In the course of the 20th century, the once fashionable content of the institution, an unimaginable number of bodies, were removed from the main building, neatly archived and put into storage, inaccessible to the public. One could claim that with this disappearance of these objects, um, large areas of the institutional history of the Natural History Museum in London were made invisible. As philosopher Jacques Derrida influentially argued, an archive shelters memory in order to forget it. Hunted down in order to order in Africa, Australia, and Asia by late 19th century British companies like Roland Ward and Edward Garrett and Son, these mounted animals are, at present, arranged taxonomically in the language of scientific globalization in brightly lit storerooms. The architecture of this off-site archive, the place from which order is given, is very different to the public part of the collection that is housed, that is housed within the neo-Gothic architecture of Alfred Waterhouse's Natural History Museum that you saw earlier. If, as Derrida says, the structure of an archive determines its content, 
the Natural History Museum's taxidermy collection, is now determined by what art critic Brian O'Doherty famously refers to as the economy of the white cube. The white cube model, with its tendency to conserve, proclaims a universal, timeless exhibition space, which is at odds with nature and its processes. Temperature and humidity are controlled to constrain the inherent life of materials. Living beings are turned into objects, frozen consumer products, and surrogates of reality. The Victorian version of taxidermy, similar to more recent hyperrealist sculptures of John De Andrea or Duan Hansen, is defined by static bodies with their clearly defined boundaries and empty cores. And these objects have come to seem unsuitable to express the evolutionary rationale that defines the Natural History Museum's approach today. An understanding of organisms as dynamic and constant exchange with one another. Nonetheless, so much could be learned here. I have been told that this archive cannot be made permanently public for conservation reasons. The Natural History Museum is bound by its duty to keep things for posterity. However, when Tessa Farmer visited the site during a residency at the museum, she came up with a revised version of what a taxidermied body could look like today. The result, Little Savages, enables its audience to reflect on the history of institutionalized taxidermy, the conservation and preservation of nature, and its rhetoric. In the 19th century, in order to cope with the vast amount of bodies killed and collected during colonial expeditions, a practice inspired by the demand for specimens uh, created by the newly founded public natural history museums, techniques of taxidermy were revised. And here you can see the workshop uh, of the collection in Paris uh, in a painting dating from 1903 called the Laboratory of Zoology. Bodies looked more lifelike and were more durable than those made in previous centuries. Taxidermists began presenting themselves as artists, as you can see here, a claim justified by the highly skilled working processes. Um, so you can, for instance, see a polychromous plaster model of the extinct dodo bird. Similarly to the myth of Pygmalion, a sculptor who managed to turn ivory into flesh and bone with the help of Venus, the rhetoric of the godlike creator was evoked. The taxidermists on the left here stages himself as artist who has mastered the seamless representation of animals and who produces paradisiacal bodies that will last eternally. This painting shows how this protagonist is mastering the representation of mostly white animals his work and that of his colleagues on the right and in the background is approved of by Kraft, a tanner here with beard, and science, uh, the museum's director in the dark suit. It was the aim of the institutions of natural history to produce uh, bodies that would last eternally, according to American zoologist and conservationist William Hornaday's manual from 1891, quote, 10 years or 10 hundred, just as the taxidermist chooses, end of quote. These two images from a manual, from a French manual dating from around 1800 are visualizing this desire. The corpse of a cat is skinning itself, um, and in this French tradition, wires are placed through the hide that appears lifeless and tau is used to upholster it. The resulting objects were claimed to be equal to living animals. As you can see in this engraving, um, the powerful of technique of preservation, in this case, wet preservation, is animating bodies, or to be more precise, reanimating something that was already dead. Taxidermy in this context meant fetishizing the concept of a primitive wilderness that was thought to be vanishing or lost. Colonialization was accompanied by environmental damage, the terrors of the hunt. As philosopher Donna Haraway points out, once dominion is complete, conservation is urgent. However, I would like to propose that taxidermy is not the representation of something pre-existing. This technique is not simply conserving nature. These bodies should rather be defined as three-dimensional models fabricated out of materials that promise authenticity. 
Taxidermists are rather producing nature in the controlled environment of the laboratory. And unlike the traditional image of the godlike artist favored by institutional discourse, the taxidermist, like an art conservator, is actually only successful if no visible trace of their work is left in the final product. Little Savages formulates a critique of this traditional understanding of taxidermy. Due to farmer's ornamental use of organic materials, her fox is neither whole nor unspoiled, but caught in the act of dissolution. The installation thus forcefully demonstrates that taxidermy is not just about the presentation of nature, but skillful handicraft, a complex cultural and aesthetic object that can be questioned as such. Additionally, Farmer's installation reminds its audience that taxidermy does not have to present a static, ossified understanding of nature, mimicking official rhetoric, but can instead expose narratives of invasion and loss. Actually, in taxidermy, there is not just frozen death, but ongoing life. Throughout the 19th um, century until today, authors writing on taxidermy expressed the fear that skins might become infested by pests. As a result, hairs and feathers fall out so that the epidermis, the skin, becomes visible, and we are confronted with the dynamic biology of decay, new ecosystems that are sometimes hard to conceal. Caricatures tell the story where seams are coming apart and ruffled feathers or mangy fur sabotage the impression of lifelikeness and arrested decay. Due to these unavoidable lawless tendencies of organic materials, many of the bodies in the stores of the Natural History Museum in London are kept together only through the use of bandages, seams are coming apart and eyes are popping out of their sockets. Reflecting on the condition of the material culture held by the archive, Little Savages updates the concept of the taxidermic body, discarding its status as a model of unspoiled nature and instead presenting a body that is immersed in the evolutionary web. The work marks the process of, oh, sorry, the work makes the process of infestation public. But the critical reference of Little Savages is still broader in that it frames taxidermy as a virus that is itself causing archive fever. By demonstrating that the trophies of the Natural History Museum will not last forever, the installation addresses psychological depth, the annihilation of memory, more precisely, the memory of colonial victory. And the fairies play a crucial part in this reassessment. As shown by farmer stop-motion animation called An Insidious Intrusion, which accompanied Little Savages in the Natural History Museum, the skeletal, winged, and strangely sexless creatures have mutated and form half-half mythological being and half-parasitic wasps, laying eggs in their hosts and hatching from them. They are invading the museum, infiltrating its objects, collections, and archives. Farmer's practice demonstrates that in the 21st century, taxidermy does not have to reinforce idealized histories of nature. While traditional taxidermy, in line with Platonic and Aristotelian notions of making and their hierarchies, insists on forming its organic material, Little Savages calls for an approach that follows the material and its processes. Last year, clothes moss had infested a mouse that was part of Farmer's installation at the Guildhall Art Gallery in London. Quote, I got an email saying we found three larvae. Can we have your permission to spray it and inject it? And I was so sorry because I have them here at home. You can't win the battle. It's a constant fight. The mouse, I saw it. It has been quite eaten. The fur looks kind of bejuggled now, which is fine. It links in perfectly with the narrative because the fairies are pulling out the hair and cutting it up, so I left it as it was." End of quote. Instead of, seeking, uh, instead of seeking to master heights, it is possible to observe and to manage the decay. So if taxidermy is the incarnation of trophy culture, it has been producing spoiled trophies. However, and this was the main aim of my book, the meanings and power relations uh, of woven into taxidermy are not assigned once and for all. The resonances which are be being built up in a particular historical constellation are not the only possible or imaginable ones. 
Tessa Farmer is revising the art of taxidermy by preserving and designing her own version of the natural world. While activists rejected zoological finery at the end of the 19th century because species like the egret in the US were nearly eliminated, to craft here means to care. Farmer is not a hunter, but a collector of overlooked materials, scavenged from public pavements, friends' gardens, woodlands, and scrub areas, given to her as gift or purchased over the internet. The fox used in Little Savages was bought at an auction and recycled, and if the artist who is vegan engages in mounting animals for other pieces, she uses roadkill. But most importantly, alongside the fairies, it is the ants, bees, and wasps that play the central role in farmers' revision of taxidermy. Insects actually make up the majority of life forms on our planet and play a very crucial role for biodiversity. But most importantly, the insects and little savages or immersive installations such as these thematize a concept of nature that is not about peace and harmony, but about the change from a static to a dynamic concept of the world. They point to the chaotic struggle of life as it was discussed in evolutionary theory from the 19th century onwards. The once clear distinction between animal and human became blurred, unstable, and even obsolete in this web of complex relations that Charles Darwin famously described in 1859. Indeed, one can repeatedly spot fairies in farmers' work that, like the zombies in Chapman and the Chapman Brothers model Hell from 2000, display spontaneous mut mutations. Farmers' handiwork and reassessment of taxidermy should be understood at a conceptual level as a miniature world that consists not of stable materials alone, but of transitions, something that indicates the swarm intelligence of decentralized self-organizing systems, collective consciousness, commuting in secret, conspiracies, and plotting. I would like to come to the last part of my talk. What kind of questions arise from considering the artistic strategy of Tessa Farmer for the practices of conservation? Farmer's artworks are unsettling because they point to death and the concept of the ruinous body. In the installation, a prize catch from 2009, like insects, fairies keep death alive when they break down corpses, stealing and remodeling the flesh, causing the desired unity and wholeness of the body to fragment, erode, and threaten, ultimately to disappear completely. The installation reminds us that nature has long been ruinous itself. Regardless of how diminished and frail a picture of our environment has become, floods, earthquakes, or climatic changes continually remind us of its power and complexity and our inability to control or predict it. Damage, decay, and difference are capable of generating their own patterns of order, except that there are no fixed positions, only shifting ones. Bad taxidermy should not be deaccessioned or repaired, but could be described as dynamic constructs and time machines in the sense of artist uh, Robert Smithson's ruins in reverse, bodies still in the process of becoming, open to unhasty examination and new tiers of meaning where the planes of time are allowed to implode. When we gaze upon ruins, we are prized away from the logic of chronologies and deliver to the waves of currents in time. Like ruins, memories are incomplete. Through this simultaneity, damaged specimens enable new forms of assemblage, and as we have uh, repeatedly heard today in the morning, it could be an interesting and extreme strategy not to hide these processes of decay, since the trash heap of civilization is a vehicle of unofficial history. In this case, it reveals mounted heights as material reminders of exploitation and colonial violence. Broken and half decomposed, they embody the state of being in between worlds rather than an unambiguous situations and power relations. In that sense, they are very valuable educational tools. But the question remains, how could conservators, who are also thing detectors, engage with organic materials in relation to contemporary art? One could argue that taxidermic specimens tell the story of our engagement with nature and its histories as we imagine it. Nature conservation, as well as caring for artifacts and artworks, is always more than slowing down decay, 
But as literary scholar Paul Eggert has argued, this process is one of active curating and editing. In this sense, taxidermists, as well as conservators, are anonymous authors of history. And rather than ask about the possible intention of one individual person who made an artifact or artwork, one should rather research the group that has made use of it or listen to the languages of the materials. Taxidermic bodies, as other artifacts, do not only exist in the physical sense. They are not stable, but in the age of dematerialization should be seen with, art, with historian of science Hans-Jörg Reinberger's words as epistemic configured things, as constantly flowing transversal change, chains of diverse stuff, spaces, stories, and fantasies about nature and human-animal relationships. And taxidermists, conservators, artists, or historians are constantly weaving this narrative. Therefore, taxidermic animals are not objects in the sense of being objective or unquestionable. What is really on show are the issues and the bones of content, um, contention, which entail assumptions, opaque translations, transmissions. In fact, a complex machinery that incorporates meeting, um, delegation, evidence, argumentation, negotiation, and summary. To render conservation visible, like artist Mark Dian did in the last show I curated with Dietmar Rübel in 2014, the Academy of Things at the Art Academy in Dresden, draws attention to the power of choice the specialists have to their social networks and their collective structures. The making of this installation, the so-called Department of Conservation and Restoration, was accompanied by lively debates with conservators from the state art collections and the art academy. Why are damaged items kept in the depot? What time layers are emphasized or removed by repairs? Are dust and decay not part of a thing's history, its biography, even if the market insists on a facelift, which I think is especially drastic in contemporary art? We, for instance, insisted on showing broken and damaged things like these animal plasters, especially since the main venue is defined by its ruinous structures that point to the bombing of Dresden during the Second World War. And um, as Friedemann Helwig had already argued in the morning, to remove these ruins uh, from public view is to erase the visible triggers of memory, and one could argue that a body without traces of age is like a mind without these memories. The processes of decay and aging remind us that our own fears of death are being projected onto artifacts which, as proxies for ourselves, have to be saved in an almost magical act. In another room of the Academy of Things, Mark Dyne mixed x-rays of human bodies with those of paintings to make this point, and these were all found within the um, Art Academy collections. As conservators know, every object is destined for ruin and in the process of decaying, even if some of this is lost on human perception. Relics, leftovers, or patina are part of the social life of things. And in the case of taxidermy, this life can be described in terms of a complex ecology, including living organisms, but also what philosopher Jane Bennett recently called the sticky materiality of an enchanted materialism. As art historians uh, have been debating also for a long time, materials have their own ways of performing, transforming, and self-organization. As material interpreters, conservators are constantly obliged to keep up with things as they brew, decompose or transform themselves, and generate languages of their own. When we translate these narrations, we do not make free autonomous decisions, but are caught up in an ecology of things where unpredictable and unintended effects can always occur. In this sense, I would like to call for conservators of fleeting materials as the producers of living ruins. A socialist and philosopher Georg Simmel posits, ruins could be places where nature and humans collaborate. To exhibit the archive of the power structures of conservation alongside an artwork, to document decay via mass media, such as photography or video, and to restage ephemeral events um, are just some of the options. Seen this way, ruins would neither give cause for melancholy nor be confined to a role as grieving monuments, but would symbolize our power to act. They urge us to take the fragments and create a new assemblage. Nature is a dynamic metabolism that alters organisms and their habitats. In the complex network of an ecosystem, there's nothing but constant change. 
things are a way of dealing with a world in which we are enmeshed rather than over which we have dominion. To come to an end, works like Little Savages ask us to keep negotiating and revisiting these environmental, social, and thing-inhabited networks. While traditional artistic values such as freedom, self-determination, and self-fulfillment have long been adopted by managers in a post-Fordian industrial world, we should rather debate how enmeshed we are with the environment. In that respect, collections featuring taxidermy are not demonstrating Rune stage so much as a permanent makeshift state in the form of an endless building site. In this fermenting compost, with its continual new hybrids of practical and theoretical knowledge, it is evident that publics have non-human elements. Just as Jakob von Uxkühl believed every animal had its own Umwelt, its own environment, we find only spheres and bubbles, accidental and provisional formations that give rise not only to many different publics, but also to proto-publics and residual or post-publics, continually forming and then dissolving again. As Bennett argues, even when we make decisions within this ecology of political actions, we are nonetheless affected by the fermentation of various bodies somehow associated with our own. From, the perspective, from this perspective, the purpose of a democratic assembly is to transform the trenches that divide speaking subjects from mute objects into a vibrant field of different trends and variable functions. For me, this means that conservation is what we make of the world rather than what we find in the world. And I hope that I could show that contemporary art practice provides material for developing questions that might lead to new strategies, technologies, and modes of perception, enabling us to consult things and materials to respond better to their statements, objections, and proposals. Obviously, this does not mean to blindly follow the voice of the artist as authority on how to care for things as large-scale interview projects at major institutions around the world are practicing it. This can only be a dialogue between many publics, including contemporary artists, critics, curators, conservators, historians, and non-humans. We are all only pieces of this puzzle and have to engage with each other in order to continuously discuss solutions of how to care for cultural heritage. Thank you.